This morning I'm going to uh, move forward um, with what I began to preach last week um, and attempt to give you a broad picture of what the labor means. But before I do that, we want to welcome with us this morning Linda and Lee Stanley. And Linda and Lee are coming from Florida, is that accurate? Yeah. Yes. And moving into the Mount Airy area. And we are so glad to have you. This is Joe, Joe and Michelle's, your Michelle's oh. aunt. And uh, we appreciate you being here. Give them a nice round of welcome. <laughs> and, uh, so we're glad you're with us and glad to have you. So uh, uh, I'm, I've been looking at the tabernacle and preaching through the tabernacle. And connecting the tabernacle, as you know, to the New Testament. And uh, looking at how we need to understand approaching God. And how the methodology that we use to approach God impacts how we appropriate the Word of God to our particular lives. That is the greatest lesson that I've gotten out of the tabernacle. Is how... What we do concerning approaching God impacts how the appropriation of the promises of God are then shared to us. Because salvation, the miracle of it in, it, in itself, does not release the promises of God except for the promise of salvation. The promises of God are not always released. God operates in many different ways. He operates through grace. He operates through mercy. He operates through miracles. But if we desire to get into the, to the depths of the promises of God, where every promise of God is yea and amen, then we need to understand the process of approaching God, how to get there, how to get into the presence of God. Because we've been taught in the Christian world that salvation automatically gives you entrance into the throne room of God. Well, here's the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Israel was not taught that. The priests were not taught that. They were not taught that without appropriate preparation that they could go into the presence of God. As a matter of fact, they were taught that if they went in ill prepared, that meant death. What an what a, what a irrefutable idea concerning approaching God. The priest that went in unwashed, unclean, and unprepared, ill prepared, when he got inside the tent, physically died. What we want to do is to understand how to get to God, to mine the wealth out of the Word of God, so that we can live and actually have the presence and the power and the promises of God operating in our lives. But I know as for me, that hasn't been something that's been taught. We just got taught we got saved. David said it Wednesday night and everything was hunky-dory. We were wonderful. Boy, we got saved, blessed God. And everything in our life was just going to be okay and it Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. There's a process of this thing that God taught Israel. So we're going to look into it today. Part two of the message concerning the labor and its significance in our approaching God. Stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word, if you will. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26 and 27 said that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Father, we thank you for the Word of God today. We thank you for those that have assembled themselves today in the house of God to hear the Word of God. I pray that you'll open their eyes that they can see in their ears, that they can hear in their heart, that they can understand what the Word of God says to them, and then that they can make application into their life so that they can so that they can grow and develop into the image of Christ. So Father, I surrender myself to you today, and I ask you to speak 
Holy Spirit, as you always do to your people, I surrender to you today. Open my eyes, my ears, my heart, that I can hear and know how to minister to this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. amen. Now, last week I talked to you about the connection between the drink of the body and the brazen altar. We also understand the connection between Jesus washing the disciples' feet and the bath at the labor. Okay? Now, one of these days, whenever I think about it, I'll bring with me and put it on the wall the picture of the tabernacle. Mom has that, gave it to me, and I have it at home, and I'll set it up on an overhead so you can get a picture of what it, what it looked like. But I, I want to give you this description of it. There was the tent, the, the, the door to the tabernacle, the door to the gated area that included the tabernacle. Once they walked in that door, there was the brazen altar a few feet from that door where blood was shed and where blood was put on the horns. And we understand that to correlate with Jesus in communion when he said, drink of my body, uh, my blood, and, and eat of my body. Then a few feet from there was the labor. The labor was the place that the priest went to wash himself to sanctify himself before he walked into the tent, what we refer to as the tent of blessing, where he found the incense burning and began the last approach to God. Okay? Jesus had a very specific relationship whenever he washed those disciples' feet because he was relating what he was doing to what they did in the Old Testament. Jesus very specifically shared with the disciples. And his sharing was an inclusion of the Old Testament priests and how they prepared for the time for when they would approach God. Now, your role as a Christian is to understand how to prepare to approach God. And I'm going to show you that today. I want you to notice in the verses which we will consider today that Jesus completed the act of washing their feet prior to unfolding the inside information to those whom he had done the action. He didn't tell them before he did it what he was doing. He told them after. He said, you are not aware of what I've done to you. But anyway, they were, filled, they were willing to move forward. Now I want you to get this. The disciples were willing to move forward with this activity because of how he responded to Peter. Do you remember how he responded to Peter? He said, Peter, uh, if I don't do this to you, you have no part in me. If I don't wash you, you have no part in me. Peter said, don't only wash my hand, my feet, but wash my head and my hand. In other words, wash all of me because I want to be in full position with you. Now those people, those men still thought that there was an imminent kingdom that was on its way, of which they would have a major portion of leadership in. So after he had washed their feet and taken their garments, and, and, and his garments, and was sat down, he said unto them, Do you know what I have done to you? Now I'm going to ask that question to you today. Do you know what being washed in the water of the Word actually does for you. Now this week I began to do a study on John chapter 1 where the Bible said that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God the Word was God. Yeah. The Word. He said, do you know what the Word has done to you? What the Word has placed His hands upon your feet to do? Jesus answered, He said unto them, what I do thou knowest not. But thou shalt know hereafter. The disciples knew what he had told Peter. And what had he told Peter? If I don't do this to you, you have no what part in me. They knew what he had told Peter. Then he completes the, ask, the acts and asked them, Do you know what I have done to you and for you? Are you aware of the fact that I have washed you? Now watch this next word so that you can be received into the blessings of God. 
so that you can actually step into the tent of blessing. So that you can go into the place where God can do for you what He said He would do, but could not do because you were not prepared for it. Now think about that a second. God has made many promises. We've got various counts on how many promises there are in the Word of God. God has made various promises. But I want to ask you a question this morning. Other than the promise of your salvation, how many promises can you point directly to that you can say, He did that for me? Well, the, the reality is there are probably very many that we can say, well, I was sick, but now I'm well. I was in need of money, but now I have money. We can look at many promises and say, well, God did that. We can ascribe many, many, many things to God. The question is, how many things can you ascribe to God because you directly were able to walk into the throne room of God, approach God, and have God directly appropriate His Word, His promise, His will, and His direction to you? See, that's what we're after here. We're after a relationship where we can go to God. Not have to count on the man. Not have to count on a friend. Not have to count on the counselor. Not have to count on a book. But we can go to God to get what it is that God has for us. He is the eternal God. The creator of all that is and was and is to come. Are you aware of what I'm doing, Jesus said? I, who God has sent to you, I, who humbles himself to wash your feet, am doing so to make you acceptable for ministry that goes beyond the veil. I will ask you today, are you doing ministry behind the veil? Someone said, what does that mean? Well, let me tell you what it means. Ministry behind the veil is ministry that is directly between you and God. It is ministry that is directly concerning your circle of influence. It is ministry that is directly between you and God about the world in which you impact. That's what the disciples did. That's how the apostles changed the world. They got into a relationship behind the veil with God and it changed the world. So I'm asking you today, are you in ministry behind the veil? Have you been sanctified by the washing of the water of the Word so that when you walk into prayer, you walk into the presence of God and your world is impacted, influenced, and changed because you are there. See, oftentimes we don't look at it like that. We look at it as going in and saying, well, God, I'm praying now. I'm talking to you, God. Hey, hey, God, are you listening? Our ministry, have we been washed in the water of the Word by the Word of God? Goes directly into the throne room of God, and I'll show you that in a minute. The only way we can get there, however, is by total preparation. We cannot get there by just coming into the blood. The blood will save you. The blood will translate you out of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. When they walked into the tabernacle, into the camp, they brought the blood. They brought the animal. The animal was slain. It was slain for surrender. It was slain for sin. It was slain whatever the case for the fifth part. But that man walked out of that, counting on the blood of the animal, 
turning his life over to the priest. The priest then took the blood, went to the labor. There in the labor, he began to wash himself to make sure that he was in total preparation for the next step. Are you in total preparation for the next step? There is always another step in God. There is always another place to go in God. There is always the place where deeper calls unto deeper that you have to prepare for. So as the priest took that blood, the Bible said that you are a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, and a holy people before the God of glory. Now it's you handling the blood. It's you handling the sacrifice. It's you standing at the labor to be clean so that you can go in to the promises of the blessing of all my Are you ready? Is it ready? Aren't you ready to carry that? Many men are saved, but they struggle with sin. They struggle with the sin nature. They struggle with the probability and the possibility of sin. They work their life. And they know that they came to Christ because they can tell you the date and the moment. They know that the grace of God is as real today to them as it was the moment they got saved. But they struggle with sin. They struggle with the act of sin. They struggle with the thought of sin. They struggle with actually being involved in sin. And yes, the question is why? Because if the blood has saved you, then why can't the blood kick you? And the answer is because you never carried the blood to the labor. You never carried the blood. See, the priest carried the blood to the labor. When he got there with the blood, he did something additional. He did something more than just bring the blood. He began to wash himself by the water of the word. What is the water of the word? Jesus said, my words. The word's words are spirit and they are life. So when they got to the labor and they began to wash themselves, they sanctified themselves, they went the next step with the blood. Think about what I just said. They went the next step with the blood. The blood was the thing that covered their sin, but when they got to the place of sanctification with the blood, they took the word which was spirit and life and washed themselves and changed themselves and prepared themselves with the blood. Oh my God. They didn't leave the blood. They supported the blood. They sanctified themselves with the word of the one who provided the blood. Yeah. See, that's a completely different position. Now that I've supported myself with the words of the one who provided the blood, I can be ready and prepared to enter into the promise of God inside the tent. Oh yeah. Now the promises of God become yea and amen. Watch me now. You're going to hear something you never heard before. The promises of God outside the tent or the tabernacle were that your sins would be forgiven. Think about this now. The promises of blessing where the promises of God were yea and amen were not in the outer court. Huh? 
Salvation, forgiveness of sin was in the outer court. The only way they could get to the promises that were yea and amen was to sanctify themselves and support the blood with the word Jesus Christ so that when they got to the temple, to the tent door, they were lost and sanctified so when they entered in, the promises of God became yea and amen to them. You mean to tell me that in the outer court, the blessings did not exist? I'm telling you the blessing in the outer court was that you would be saved. The blessing in the outer court was that you would come to know God. It was not until he washed them in the water of the word that they could have a part in him. So when they washed themselves in the labor, they knew that a few steps away was the place where every promise Every promise in him. In what? The man whose words support the blood. Who? Oh. The man whose words support the blood. So when they washed themselves, when they heard the word, when they studied the Word, when they meditated on the Word, when they thought of the Word, when they cared about the Word, when they walked in the knowledge, Hosea made this comment. He said, you do not know the Word of God, therefore you cannot be priests unto me. But if you know the Word, and you have been washed in the water by the Word, then you can walk into the tent of blessing and there every promise in him is yea and amen. Well, that's good news for me. Behind the veil. But we've not prepared ourselves to go there. We've not prepared ourselves in the word of God. Listen to what Jesus said. Watch this now because this is a big comment Jesus is going to have to make. He said, you call me Master and Lord. What's he saying to them? What is he saying when he makes that comment? Let me tell you what he's saying. He said, you call me Master and Lord, you don't know what you're talking about. You call me Master and Lord because you think I'm going to set up a kingdom right now and because I'm going to set up a kingdom, you're going to have a great position in it. You call me Master and Lord and you are correct, but you don't understand why. Yes, it's true, I'm out of eye. Jesus referred to himself as Master and Lord just like he was referred in the Old Testament. I am the ruler and master. Jesus using the Old Testament revelation of God. You referred to me that way in Deuteronomy when he said, Ye say well, for so I am, but you don't understand what you're saying. You don't understand what you're saying about me. Jesus said, I, then your Lord and Master, have washed your feet. You don't understand what you're saying about me. You call me Lord, and I am, but you don't get it yet, because you're not aware of what I've done to you. I have washed your feet. Because I have prepared you for the tent of blessing. You also must understand that you must wash by the word, by me. Other people that are to come after you. Because you will never be received into the tent of blessing until you're washed, until you're prepared, until you're cleansed. The promises of God, unless they come strictly and totally by the mercy and miracle of God, will not be appropriated unto man until man brings the blood and supports the blood with a sanctified, holy, peculiar life of priesthood that knows the word of the washing of the word of Almighty God must support the blood. 
said, I have done this so that you can do it to others. Why would it be necessary for them to do it to others? So that others can know who the master and who the ruler is. The approach to God, listen to this comment, is extremely specific. It is exacting and it has definite prerequisites and standards to which we must adhere. See, the world wants us to believe that God is an all-accepting, all-inclusive inclusive God who has no standards. He has no righteousness. He has no reason. But if that were true, then why in the world did a God with no standards, no beliefs, no critical thoughts, no real design or plan take the most beautiful angel he had and cast him out of heaven. Why did God choose to look at Lucifer and cast him down if he has no standards, if he has no systems, if he has no designs, if he has no regulations, if he has nothing, he would have looked at Lucifer and said, Oh, Lucifer, boy, you're having a bad day. That's just too bad that you feel that way, Lucifer. I know you want to take my place. Oh, that's just too bad. Maybe we can share. It's possible, you know, we can work together. Huh. We can walk hand in hand, arm in arm, me and you, buddy. We can, oh, Lucifer, think this. Let me work on the 24-hour rule. You heard of that rule? That rule says that if something happens that you don't like, something says something, someone says something you don't like, Something hurts you or someone hurts you. Before you respond, before you say a word, you wait 24 hours and see then how you feel about it. And if after 24 hours you still feel the same way, then you go ahead and say something about it or do something about it. Or enact or don't ever enact the rule. Until you wait 24 hours to see if that's really the right thing to do. 24 hour rule. I don't see God operating like that. I don't see God joining up with sin. I don't see God joining up with rebellion. And I don't see God trying to talk a third of the angels into staying with him if they wanted to rebel with Lucifer. I don't see that. What I see is a God that calls sin what it is and cast him into the out of heaven and down below him and then sent Jesus Christ to utterly destroy every work in which he does and has done. God has specific measures and specific means. God is not a God that does not have a definite standard. Do you know who the standard of God is? His name is Jesus Christ. He is the righteousness of God. He is the Word of God that was with Him from the beginning, that is with Him, that is the great high priest, that is the one who is the high priest over His own blood, that is the one whose words are spirit and life and change the inner man until the inner man can come to know and be reconciled to the God of glory. That's who it is. He has standards, ladies and gentlemen. Bless his name. He has standards. He is not absent of standards. It's through the complete purging and cleansing that the promises of God are activated. Now watch that statement. It's through the complete purging and cleansing of God 
that the promises of God are activated. The only promise that was activated in the outer court was the promise that you would be saved. That's the promise that was enacted in the outer court. The blood would then be supported by sanctification. Sanctification, the washing of the water of the word would then take you to the to gate, the door of the tent, the flap of the opening of the tent of the tabernacle. And when he walked into that, he was sanctified and could walk in and experience every promise that is in the book. That is yea and amen inside the tent. That's what Jesus was telling the disciples. Now here we find out why people lose confidence in God. This is the gospel truth. This is the singular reason that people are not able to access the promises of God and cannot figure out why. They then lose confidence in God due to their own misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the truth of God. And they walk around and they say, I, I, I don't know where God is. I, 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 is there even a God? If there was a God, how come this and how come that? The preacher told me that if I'd get saved, everything in my life would fall in place. I, I, I would no longer have a problem. I'd no longer have a care. I'd no longer have a worry because he just said that, that if I'd just come to Christ, that, that my, uh, my desire to sin would go away. My, my, my need to drink, my need to do drugs, my need to have illicit sex. They were all passed from me. I would no longer have that to deal with. And, and, and here I am and I'm struggling. I'm struggling with sickness. I'm struggling with, with, with all the trials of life that I don't understand because they said. The truth of the matter is until you learn how to access the promises of God until you learn how to support the blood through the Word, Jesus Christ, and His words which are spirit, and His words which are life, you will not walk into the tent of blessing, and therefore you will wonder, why am I in the outer court? Now let me tell you something, church. There were lots and lots of people in the outer court. The outer court had all kinds of people. It had people bringing sacrifices. It had priests carrying sacrifices. But inside the tent, there were only a few. There were only a few people in there, a few priests in there, at a time, experiencing the presence of God. Experiencing the promises of God. If you want to get there, there's a process to get there, church. There's a way to get there for every man. You know why? Because you've been called a, a priest. You've been called a holy people. You've been called a peculiar people. God has said to you that you have access. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you, so that those that follow you and follow the word that you teach will gain the same access. That's why he said that. Listen to what I'm saying here. He said, I have done this so that you can do it to others. What was it that they were supposed to tell others? Be sanctified by the Word of God. Let the Word of God change you. Let the Word of God cleanse you. Let the spirit of life that is in the Word of God sanctify you until you can access the very promises of God. Paul said in Hebrews 4, 4 uh, 14 through 16, Seeing then that you <coughs> have a great high priest, we have a Lord and Master that has become the great high priest of our confession and profession that has heard himself according to Ephesians 6.14 with the truth and washed us with his own hands and cleansed us with the truth of the gospel. That man is passed into the heavens and here is the key portion of this scripture. He has passed into the heavens. He has made an avenue and a direction. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast what he told us to do. Wash yourself in the water. Cleanse yourself in the word of God. Purge yourself in the labor. So that you can enter in. Hold fast your acknowledgement that what he has done. He has prepared you to do also. For ye have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Now watch this now. 
Listen very carefully. Now he has passed into the heavens and we acknowledge that he has prepared us to do the same. Listen to what I'm telling you. Jesus Christ prepared you to enter the throne room of God if you will come by the way of the washing of the water of the word and support the blood by being sanctified by the word of Jesus Christ. Now watch what I'm about to say. Now he has passed into the heavens and we acknowledge that he has prepared us to do the same. It is this, if this referred to the resurrection. Now listen to me now. Then there would be no place for infirmities. If this referred to the second coming of Christ, there would be no place for infirmities. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Heaven has none of those. We experience those here on earth. Now watch. So as the high priest of our acknowledgement is also the high priest of our covenant or our promises that we make through our confession, the word himself delivered to us through the covenant of preparation which is the promise of truth that we are made ready to walk into the presence of God right now. Now watch. You get saved. You don't do anything in the Word. You don't meditate. You don't study. You don't read. You don't spend time in. You don't come to church. You don't come to Bible study. You don't serve, support, and invest yourself in the Word with you and with others, then you are not prepared to enter in to the very tent of God where the blessings of God reside. There must come a time when you sacrifice yourself so that you can walk into the presence of God. It's today that it can be. All right. This very moment, provided we are washed by the Word of God and cleaned and perfect due to His position as high priest and our submission to His purging. But was at all points tempted like as we are yet without sin? Let us now, let us now, because we have been prepared, come boldly unto the throne of grace. And here it is. The reason for John 13, 5 through 14, Jesus was literally cleaning the way to our access to the throne room of God. He was literally washing them so that they could teach and reassume the role of washing others so that every man could have access to the blessing. Let us therefore come on into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Compassion is found in the presence of God for all of men's needs. But in order to take in the grace and mercy referenced here, a person must be able to access, listen to that word, access the throne room. How do you do that? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek first Jesus. There's the secret, ladies and gentlemen. And all the access you need will be added unto you. Seek Jesus. Seek Jesus. Seek Jesus. Seek Jesus. Seek Jesus. Someone said, well, I've been saved. What do I need to seek Him for? Because Jesus said, my words are spirit in their life. In me, every promise is yea and amen. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Now, Father, I have given these people this portion of the washing of the water by the Word. I have shown them today, God, what your Word said. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. And hear your word said and find grace to help 
in time of need. Father, today we have a time of need. In this room, God, there are many needs. There are needs of healing. There are needs of direction. There are needs of purpose. There are needs concerning your intentions. There are needs of finance. God, there are many needs in this building and among this people. Now, God, today I have told them how the priest prepared to enter into the tent of blessing. And I have shared with them that they are priests as well. They are a holy people and a peculiar people. But God often, our cultural and societal teachings about you have left us short in the knowledge of the truth. Today, God, I ask you to open their eyes that they can see that it is the word that was with you in the beginning and the word that is you and the word that speaks the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus and the word that supports the blood that saved them. It is the word that washes them. And it is the Word that prepares them. And it is the Word that is spirit in them. And it is the Word that is life in them. So that they can find help in their time of need. Now God, quicken this to them, I pray. Quicken this to them, I pray. Quicken this to them, I pray. Quicken it to their spirit. Quicken it to their lives. Quicken it to their heart. Quicken it to their soul. Now, Father, as they pray, in some cases as they repent of not pursuing you appropriately, in some cases as they develop in themselves, the royal priesthood of which you have called them. In some cases where they acknowledge for the first time in their life. You know God I am a priest. I am a royal priest. I am a holy person. I am a peculiar person. As they acknowledge that today. And as that acknowledgement brings about in them. A washing. As that acknowledgement brings about them the reflection of Jesus Christ in their life. As that acknowledgement brings up in them a spirit of worship and a spirit of praise and a spirit of thanks and a spirit that says, You are building in me the promises of God belong to me because Jesus is in me. Now I have a hope of glory. I have a hope of promise. I have a hope that whatever the Word has said about me belongs to me and I can enter in and approach you and find my help today. As they pray that prayer, I pray that they will stand and worship you and honor what you're doing on the inside of me. I stand today to say thank you. I stand today to say thank you. As they rise to praise your name. Because they see that they are the holy priesthood of God. They are the holiness of God. They are the royal priest. It is you of whom the Bible spoke. It is God's people of whom the Word of God has called a royal priest. Oh God, prepare me to receive and to walk in the incense of the praise and glory tent where your promises are appropriated to me. In Jesus' name, 
Raise your hands and thank Him. Praise your name, Father. I am the priest you're talking about. I am the one. I am the holy person. I am the royal priesthood. I am the one who supports the blood by the study and the knowledge of the truth in the Word of God. I am the one. I am He. I am her who supports the blood by being washed and sanctified and clean before you. I am the one. I am the one. I am the one, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Thank you, Father. I am He. I am her. It is me. It is me, God, that you referred to when you said that I had access into the throne room of God, that there I could find me, the priest, the priestess could find help in every moment of need, in every trial, in every struggle. The promises of God are predicated and given and appropriated to me as yea and amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Glory. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you. Glory to God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Open your mouth and begin to praise Him a minute. Those of you that are filled with the Spirit, begin to sense the urge of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and worship Him in that wonderful language that belongs to you, that enters you directly into conversation with Almighty God. Father, we praise you today and honor you and thank you. We give you glory today for what you've done and what you're doing. We give you glory that we are the priesthood of whom you have called into being and into your presence, God. Into your presence, God, is where you have allowed us to go and call us to be. We thank you for that today in Jesus' name. We praise you and we worship. And we give you glory. Give him one more time. Raise your hands and just praise him a second. Give him glory to God. Give him praise. Just lift your hands and praise him. Because it's you he's talking about. It's you he's talking about. Brandon, he's talking about you. Juliana, he's talking about you. Linda, he's talking about you. When he says holy and peculiar, Jesse, he's talking about you. Uh, Sheldon, he's talking about you. Tara, David, Charles, he's talking about you. Linda Lee, he's talking about you. Steve and uh, Christine, he's talking about you. Martha, Lorraine, Heather, he's talking about you. Wade, he's talking about you. Joe and Michelle and Maddox, he's talking about you. He's talking about Becky and the children and Rita and Mom and Dan and, and Tony and Steve and Sharon and Mike. The royal priesthood is who we are. And every promise belongs to me. Glory to God. Give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Hallelujah to the name of God. Glory to His name. Praise your mighty name. Glory to God. Boy, I'm going to tell you that's good stuff now. That's good stuff. Look at him. It only cost me one watch band. Hallelujah. I got it for free minus one watch band. Glory to God. But I'd give five, ten, fifteen, or twenty to have what I feel right now. Will you? Amen. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, what a great place it's been. And, uh, uh, I don't know whether I finished this or not, and I may come back to it, try to finish it next week. Uh, but you can't, we cannot emphasize this enough. If we cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, I can't preach it enough until I feel like the Holy Ghost releases me from preaching this to you because for you to get where you want to be, you have to go through the process that God has set forth. You understand that? God set forth the process. I didn't. It was my role to listen to the Holy Ghost and that the Holy Ghost through me share the process with you. Amen? Listen, I love you. 
I appreciate you. Thank you all for being in this area. I appreciate that. God bless you this week, Wednesday night. Becky will be teaching. She did a great job last week teaching us on Paul's writings and how to uh, discern how Paul is writing the word. And uh, I don't know exactly where she'll go with that this week, but I guarantee it'll be good. Then after that, Julianne is coming to teach for us for two weeks, and then we'll see where we go from there. Call your people on your list. If you don't have a phone number, then get with me and I'll give you the number that I have. Listen, did I tell you this today? Let me think. I love you. I appreciate you. I appreciate your work. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate your giving. I appreciate your prayer. I appreciate everything about you. And I hope that this message is quickened to your heart and you'll walk out of here as a changed person. Not just saved anymore, but now walking in the priesthood that God called you to. Amen. Tony, I forgot you. You know who you are? You're a royal priest. Did you know that you're a peculiar person? Now others say that about you in one way. I'm saying it about you in the God's way. Amen. <laughs> you're a holy dude back there, Tony. God bless you. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Minister to your people as we need. I pray that you'll take care of them, keep them, give them peace, counsel them with great glory. And for all of that, we'll give you honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.